Hey, my name's Dan and welcome to this mini course on code overrides. So before we get started, there's a couple of course assets you should know about. Now there are two Framer Remix links somewhere down below. One is the completed course file. So you can dive in and have a look at the finished versions of each override. And then there's a start version of this file, which has no overrides in it. And you can use that to follow along with the lessons. There's also a Figma file with a bunch of diagrams and explainers that I'm going to use in the early lessons. It's not really necessary for the course, but if you want to refer back to these diagrams, there'll be a link for that down below. Okay, so how does this course work? Well, the first lesson, this lesson, is a quite basic introduction to overrides. So if you've built a couple of overrides before, you'll probably find this lesson a little bit slow, but if you're brand new to overrides, you'll get a lot of benefit going through the basics. The lessons after this one are split up into the two main use cases for overrides. The first one is using the store to control UI state and share it between overrides. And the second is pulling in dynamic data from outside of Framer and displaying it in your components. Now, during those two lessons, we'll build a bunch of overrides, starting off with quite simple ones like this counter component and ending up with quite advanced ones like this movie component that fetches data from an external API. Anyway, that's enough waffling. Let's jump into the first lesson. Okay, so in this lesson, we're gonna be talking about what a code override is and why you'd want to use one. Before we do that, let's jump into how you even apply a code override. So to apply a code override, you just select any element on the canvas. It can be a component or it can be just a normal framer element. And then go to the code override section, click on the plus. Now, code overrides are grouped into files. So if you select this drop down, you'll see all the files you have available to you. And for us, that's just this testing file. And so if I select a file, I can select the overrides that are exported from that file. But I can also create a new override file by hitting new file. So if I do that and give it a name, you can see that Framer creates this example file and it exports three different overrides. It has one called with rotates, it has one called with hover, and one called with random color. Now to apply this override, I have to go back into our homepage. I can select the button and apply the new override. So I want to pick the my first override file and I'm going to select with rotate. Now, when I preview that, the button is rotated 90 degrees. So to edit this override, all we need to do is hit edit code, and it takes us back to this view. But now if we hit the preview button, we can open up this desktop preview, and we can see the effects of our override live. So now if I change this rotate to 45, you can see that we see the update live. And really, this is the best way to iterate on a code override with the code on the left and the applied code override on the right. But before we carry on, we should probably back up and explain what exactly a code override is. So you can kind of think of a code override as a thin wrapper around a framer element. And this thin wrapper allows us to do some stuff in code and pass the results down to the framer element. But in reality, an override is actually just a function that takes a framer element as an input allows us to write some code that will change that element in some way and returns the same element as an output. Now, you might be wondering what the difference is between a code override and a code component, where an override is a function that takes a framer UI element and returns it. A code component is a component built entirely out of code where we can tweak the input parameters to change the appearance of the output. So instead of wrapping around an element like an override, a code component is a component on its own. Now, code overrides come with a couple of constraints. The first constraint is that we can't see their effects on the canvas. If I switch back to Framer quickly, you'll notice that I can only see the effects of this with rotate override when I'm using a preview window. If I go back to the canvas, you'll see that the button isn't rotated. And this can make them a little bit tricky to work with because you can't always see their effects. The second constraint of overrides is that you can't pass dynamic values to them. So if you want an override that changed a button's color, for instance, you would need to create separate overrides for each color change. The user can't apply dynamic values to a code override. You just have to create separate ones. So if I wanted these buttons to be rotated at different angles, I need to create a new override. So we just do something like this. We're gonna say with rotate one, and we're gonna say 90 degrees. And then I need to go back and apply this one now we can see that they are rotated separately. If you need to pass in dynamic values, you probably need a code component instead. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about why you would even use a code override. 
because the examples I've shown you so far are all things you could do within Framers UI. And while overrides have a bunch of applications, they're very useful for two things in particular. The first thing is they allow elements to share state. So in this example, we have a toggle that switches between annual and monthly pricing on a pricing page. And when we click this toggle, it updates the store with the billing period, either annual or monthly. And in our pricing component, we listen for the change in period and update the price. Now this is what makes code overrides so incredibly powerful and helpful if you're building a rich UI. And you'll find yourself using this over and over again to control UI state. Now the second useful application is passing dynamic values into a component. And I know that earlier I said you can't pass dynamic values into an override, but what I mean by this is that we can use overrides to fetch data from outside of Framer and populate our components. So in this case, we have a login and sign up button, but we wanna check if the user is already logged in. If they are logged in, we wanna return this variant of the button. And if they aren't logged in, we wanna return this variant. So these values are dynamic in the sense that they are coming from an external data source and they're not being set by us in the UI. And really there are tons of ways to use this with pre-existing APIs that mean that your website won't just be static, it'll feel dynamic and data-driven. So let's talk about the anatomy of a code override. So each one of these pieces of code is its own override. And to start with, we have this export keyword and that exports a code override from this file. So if this is missing, you won't be able to select the override in the dropdown. Next up, we have the function keyword, which tells us that this is a function. Here we have the name of the override with rotate. And this is the name that will appear in the dropdown. It's common practice with overrides to name them in this way. So they're always named with, and then a description of what they do. Next up, we have the input parameter, which is a component. And this is the framer element that we've applied this override to. Remember, it's passed in as an input to this code override. This bit here is just a TypeScript type. You don't really have to worry about this. Just make sure when you copy this code override that you do include this TypeScript type. Now, the override actually returns a function which returns the component, which is a bit confusing. But all you need to know is you're never gonna write any code over here, and all the code you're gonna write will be here. Now you're probably wondering what this props object is. And those are all the original properties that have been passed down from Framer into this component. So for our button, it'll be the corner radius and the background color and all that sort of stuff. And then the first thing we do is pass all of those properties back onto the component so that those styles are still applied. And then on the component itself, we get to make the changes to the component that we want. So here we have a simplified way of thinking about a code component that takes away a lot of that syntax that we were just dealing with. So here we have the code override name, and over here we have the component that's being passed into our override. We then return this component, pass the original properties back into it so that the styling doesn't break, and apply new properties. And then it spits out our component with those changes. So you can see in this example, we're passing in a component, imagine it's a button, and then we have a piece of code that generates a random color and applies it to the button. That means that every time this piece of code is run, it will output a different color onto our button. Now, one important thing to note is that if you don't pass in the original props to our component, the width and height that you've applied to that element in Framers UI won't be applied. And in most cases, the element won't even display anymore. Now in the case of our button, because it's a component that has its own intrinsic width and height, that isn't the case. But you'll see that when I remove the props, the button text goes back to the default button text because the properties we're passing in aren't making it there. Now the keen amongst you will have noticed that these properties, animate, transition, while hover, aren't your typical HTML attributes. So where do they come from? Well, they're actually framer motion attributes. And Framer Motion is a React library that powers all of Framer's animations. And so all of these components are actually Framer Motion components. And so we can use some of the Framer Motion attributes that we have access to. So over here, I have a little summary of all the attributes you have access to. The first five are all gestures. So while hover, while tap, while focus, etc., And they allow us to change what the element looks like when any of these gestures are taking place. For the most part, you won't need any of these because you can set all of this within Framers UI anyway. The last four are ways to override the styling or properties, but let's go look at how this works in practice. So I set up this test file, which demonstrates some of these attributes. So the first one is this while hover attribute, and that just allows us to change the appearance of the button when someone's hovering over it. 
which is pretty self-explanatory. While tap does the same thing, but only when the button is being pressed, as you can see here, and all the other gestures I pointed to earlier work in the same way. Next up, we can use the style attribute to override the default styles of our element. So if I remove this background red, it should go back to being blue. I've also offset its Y position so it's 60 pixels higher than it should be. Now you should actually never need to use the style attribute because you can set most of these parameters using Framer's UI. And in fact, I only recommend using this if you need to use some CSS attribute that Framer hasn't added to the UI yet. Next up, we have animate, which allows us to animate something from its default position to a new position. So if I refresh this, the button rotates 15 degrees over the course of two seconds. But again, most of the animations you can set here can be handled within Framer's UI. Next up, we can use the variant attribute to control which variant of our component is being used. So if I change this to be primary dark, you can see that it switches the variant of our button component to be the dark version. And this is very useful if we want to dynamically set the variant based on something happening elsewhere in the UI. And then lastly, if we have a text element, we can use the text attribute to change its contents, which again is going to be really useful when we want to set the text based on some external data source. Okay, so that's pretty much it for this first introduction to code overrides. In the next lesson, we're going to actually build some overrides like this counter here, for instance, to show you how to put everything I've just mentioned into practice. Catch you at the next one.